I'm Chiquita Jameson. I am a sales coach, a speaker, and a best-selling author, and I am so grateful to have you here with me today, and we're going to have some, some real fun. And what we're going to talk about is the secret to having a successful sales conversation every time, not just sometimes, every time. So I want to welcome you, and I'm going to share some things with you you might not have thought about before. So please be ready to take notes, whether it's on your computer or handwritten, whatever. But I, you may have some aha moments in here. So get ready, because you're going to be surprised. Now. I started my sales career way back when I was in my early 20s. I had absolutely no sales experience whatsoever. I, was, I taught high school for one year right out of college and thought, my God, if I'm going to work this hard, I'm going to get paid for it. Well, I, I say audition because I used to be an actress, but I, um, I actually applied for a sales position, a telephone sales position job. I was turned down three times, and the only reason I got hired after being turned down the third time was because the guy I was, that I was, uh, was going to take the job decided he would stay with the company he was in. So on a cold February Friday, I get this call at a little after 4, 4 p.m. telling me I was hired, and I was so excited, but she said, you know what? You're going to be on a plane on Sunday for six weeks of training. All right, well, let me tell you, I, I went to training. I was the most enthusiastic person you could ever think of. I was green as, you know, a, a green pepper. But the bottom line is when I got back from training, I had product training, I had sales training. I got back, I got into the flow of the things, of things. And to be quite frank with you, I was terrible. I, for the first year, first few years, uh, at least first six months, I spent most of my time in the bathroom crying because I took everything personal. But what I found out is that it, I was in this mode of mediocrity to average salesperson for literally years. And when I finally realized, when I finally got it over a myriad of reasons why, when I finally realized that I was the one that was standing in my own way, it was me. When I realized that I needed to take responsibility for my own lack of sales uh, production, when I stopped blaming the company, when I stopped blaming my manager for putting too much on me, when I stopped blaming the support system who wasn't moving fast enough, when I took responsibility, and once more, when I learned what I needed to learn, in the sales conversation, that is when my life changed, and that is when I became the success that I wanted to be. So what I'm going to do, what I'd like to ask you at this point is, I want you to think about your sales conversation. Think about your sales conversation. Do you lead the conversation, or does the customer lead the conversation? Do your sales conversations have order? Do they have structure? And if not, why? Think about that. Now, I can hear some of you say, oh, Chiquita, oh, come on. Yeah, come on. Today's old, th this is a new world. We don't go for that structure stuff. That doesn't make any sense. We want to be free flowing. We want to have the, a conversation. We want the customer comfortable. Well, of course you do. But let me share the light with you. If you don't have a handle on where your conversation is going, I will promise you that that customer is going to lead you to somewhere you don't want to be. So I'm just saying that out of structure comes order. Out of order comes success. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So with that, I want to share something with you. This is a wonderful, wonderful quote from a woman that is actually one of my um, mastermind coaches. Her name is Ursula Menches. And Ursula says, selling is as easy as you make it. And that is so true. Selling is not simple, but I do believe that it can be made easy. And yes, it can. And I'm here to show you how it can be because I've proven it myself. All right. And I want you to think about this. Do you know anything in life that does not have a structure? Everything in life is created from some kind of order, 
A seed grows into a tree, right? Architectural drawings are the beginning of a finished project. You can't have a house or a building without starting with some kind of order so that you don't end up with chaos, you end with order. You have to begin as a puppy before you become a dog. All right, make sense? It's order. Now, do your sales conversations look like this? Mine sure did when I first started. Or this, how about that? It's awful. Or is this the effect of your sales conversations? <laughs> do you ever feel that way? I certainly did when I first started. Well, how do you move from chaos to order? And that's what we're gonna talk about. And we're gonna do it by talking about structure because structure brings order to your sales conversation. It helps you become organized, become confident, professional, successful. When you know where you're going, you feel completely confident. And that's what I want to help give you. What's the difference between the role of a sales rep and a customer service rep? Anybody? You might want to write, write it in if you tell me. What do you think the difference is between in the roles? Think about that. Absolutely right. Nothing. I want you to think about this. If you're in sales, if you are absolutely in sales, the first thing you should be doing is serving your customer. So there's not a lot of difference, if any, between a sales rep or a customer service rep. So I want you to think of yourself as being a, a customer service representative. Okay? All right. What's the most important thing that you need to establish with your customers? in order to serve them. Anybody? You're right, a connection. That's exactly right. It's a connection. When you have a connection, what you have is the platform to be able to have a wonderful conversation with your customer. Now, how do you do that? This is how you do it. And what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to highlight each one of these steps. This is the, my nine-step sales conversation process, and you can see that in my book, which is Don't Sell, Let Them Buy. But right now, let's, let's go through each one. We're going to do one at a time. So first one is this. It's assume the lead. Now notice that I did not say assume control. I said assume the lead. And what, it, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you show gratitude. You say, for example, let me give you an example. Wanda, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to visit with you today. That's gratitude. Or if you're on the telephone, Lisa, thank you for taking my call today. I've really looked forward to this visit. Show gratitude. Start off that way. And then you acknowledge their time because they're busy. So I would say, Wanda, thank you so much for seeing me today. I know that you're busier in a one arm paper hanger. That's just the Midwest coming out of me. Or I know your, your time is precious. So you've shown gratitude. You've acknowledged. Now what do you do? And I bet this is something that you don't do. And I'm telling you, it's going to help you like nobody's business. The third thing you do is you give the agenda of how your conversation is going to go. And you do that because you don't want to be the thing that won't leave in their head. They need to know there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. For example, Janet, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to see you today. I know your time is precious, so in order to keep us both on track and to make sure that I'm cognizant of your time schedule, this is what I'd like to do. I first of all, I just want to sit and visit with you for a little bit. I've had a chance to study your website. I looked at your collateral. All is good. But I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you have to say about questions, some certain questions that I have to ask. And then what I'd like to do is if, if both of us feel that, uh, then what I'd like to do is to educate or basically share with you a little bit about my company and what I have to offer and who we are, and why people choose to do business with us. And then, at the end of that, I would like to just ask you, you know, we can decide if it makes sense for both of us to move forward. We can then go on and decide if we want to go on to the next step. Does that make sense? Okay, 
So what you've done, I hope that makes sense to you, uh, show gratitude, acknowledge the time, and give the agenda. So they know you're the thing that won't, that you're not going to be the thing that won't leave. All right. Next, this is, these are your questions. You're going to ask, you're going to listen, you're going to learn. It is your time to listen. But before we go into that, what are the most important discoveries that you can make about your customer? Well, first of all, it's the needs. You want to find out what their needs are. You want to find out what they want. Just because they need something doesn't necessarily mean they want it. And what their pain points are. Now, what are we talking about? What's the difference between needs and pain points? Need, for example, somebody may need uh, a CRM. And they want to have their life simplified. And they want to get rid of a pain point, such as every time they go to their email, they can't find what they're looking for. So there's your needs, your wants, and your pain points. So that's what the purpose is of your questions. So now, what kind of questions do you ask? You don't want to be an order taker, folks. That's not that we're, I'm so far away from that, it's not even funny. What you want to do is to be different than all of your competition, and that is you want to ask thought-provoking questions. Be different. Think about whatever, whatever you're selling and think about deeper questions that you can ask to get your customers to think. For example, I had a wonderful opportunity to work with an amazing uh, insurance company that, and, and work with their sales representatives. So what we did is we thought about what kind of questions can we ask if, I'm, if they're selling auto insurance that would be on a deeper level, that you wouldn't be automatically, for example, one question that a lot of insurance, auto insurance people ask right off the bat is, well, tell me what your limits of liability are now. Well, then you begin, they start reading off what their limits are, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, in, an, you're in money. You're talking money. You don't want to do that especially if what they have is totally wrong for them. So look at this. How about asking this? What are three worst case scenarios that you want total coverage for? Now, why would you ask that? Well, if you live in California, for example, this gets you to think of what's a worst case scenario. Is it worse to hit a Pinto or is it worse to hit a Tesla? You need coverage. Let them tell you what they want. Let them tell you what the worst case scenarios are. Besides yourself, who else will be driving your car? Or will, will uh, there be a passenger in the car? You're setting up a scenario in their head to think about the amount of coverage that they need. Describe your average work day and focus on the amount of time you are in your car. Okay? Uh, tell me about your weekends. How much... How much uh, do you and your family, how much of the time are you in the car? They hadn't thought about that. Who asked that question? Think about your children who are now driving. What have their driving experiences been thus far? Thank God I don't have kids. I was scared to death about the answer to that one. My point is thought-provoking questions are questions that you want to ask that get people to think off of price and on to what their real needs are and wants need to be. So what you're going to do is when you ask these questions, all you're doing is listening. I don't care what industry you're in. You're just listening and you're acknowledging, okay, I see. All right. Don't talk about your product or service. Even if you're just itching to say, well, we've got a product. No, this is not the time to do that. Let them have the stage. Let them talk. You need to be focusing on what are the products and services I have that can answer what they just said, what they're looking for. If a customer tells you that they, that all of a sudden they say, you know what, Chiquita, I'm not interested in anything like this. All I want to do is just give me, cut to the chase, give me the price. Well, I'm here to tell you, or I guess I'm going to ask you, do you automatically clam up or grab for your rate sheet? Don't do that. I used to do that. That's wrong. You're the professional. And this is what you do. If somebody says to you, Chiquita, just cut to the chase, I would say, first of all, I would ask them if they're in kind of a weird mood, I, I would stop and I'd say, I'm sorry, did I, did I say something wrong? 
oh, no, no, it's just, I, I kind of know what I want. I totally, then you calm them down. Do a, do a check there to find out where their head is. Or you could say, well, you know what? You have every right to hear what the price is. And as soon as I know what it is, I'm going to tell it to you. So just hang in there. I've got a few more questions to ask. And you just keep moving. To answer, never, ever, ever answer an objection until you are ready to do so. And at this point in the call is not the way to do it. You defer it. You steer to your next question. You be neutral. And you collect all the information you need. Now, I'm going to quickly show you in this next slide what I just did. And I call it ADAPT. And I go through a, a, a whole thing on overcoming objections. That's a whole workshop I have that's so much fun. I want you to keep in mind that you are in the lead. You're not controlling, but you're leading. And you're the one that determines when objections are going to be answered. And just keep it conversational. You're the one in control. Remember, if the customer says no, you're not going to lose an arm. You're not going to lose a leg. This is not a hill to die on. So just hang in there. The first thing you want to do is when someone says, Chiquita, just cut to the chase. Or what, can you just give me the price? What's the price? You know what? That's a good question. As soon as I know what it is, I'm going to happy to, to give it to you. So what you're going to do is you're going to defer it. You acknowledge. I understand you want, you want to hear the price. I get that. To defer, I'm going to get to it, I promise you, in just a minute, and push through. However, right now, let me ask, please, just go with me a minute and let me ask you this. That's called ADAPT. Take that down in notes. I guarantee you that will change your, the way you think of your, uh, when you get objections. Okay, let's move on. Now, after you've gotten all the information from the customer, now what you want to do is you want to summarize. Okay, you want to summarize what you heard. Why do we do this? Well, first of all, you want to make sure you understood what the heck the customer just said. You want to give the customer a chance to make corrections. Maybe you heard something incorrectly. And you want the customer to know that they've been heard and they've been understood. But finally, you really want the customer to hear what they said repeated to them in their own words because guess what? When you get to your recommendation or you get to the points where you're making your where you're trying to answer an objection, you're going to use their words right back at them. Okay? All right, after you summarize, now it's your turn to take the stage. You are going to give an educational presentation. And what it's going to be is, number one, it's got to be easy to follow. So the customer knows exactly what you're doing, and you are not using your vernacular. You've got to work with a colleague, work with somebody, so that you can educate someone in, at, on, in terms that they understand. Don't use crazy widget words that only mean something to you and the people you work with at your company. They need to directly, when, when you educate, you are directly relating whatever you're saying to solving their problem. Now, you will already know this because these are the customers that you're reaching. Most of your customers will have many of the same problems. So you can be prepared ahead of time. Be brief and to the point. Don't be the thing that won't stop talking. And then deliver whatever you're saying with enthusiasm and, and, and uh, passion. All right? And for heaven's sakes, you're proving value. All right, now I can hear you say, well, Chiquita, that, okay, what? Can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, I can. You want to cover three topic areas. The first topic area is you want to talk about who my company is. Who are we? Where do we come from? What are we doing? You're not giving the whole shebang, but you are creating a presence. You're creating stability. And you're also talking about your products and services and the features and benefits as they relate to the customer and the needs and wants and pain points that you just previously discovered. And the last thing you want to do is you want, you, you want customers to know why. Other customers, just like them, decide to choose to do business with you and your company over the competition. Do not talk badly about the competition. You can even compliment them, you know, on something that they've done. 
However, you have a better solution. All right. But, and this is why customers have chosen to do business with you. So that's your education part. Now, <clears throat> this is what happens. We're going to move from education. And at the end of education, remember what we said in the agenda that at, at the end, uh, at the end, after I've shared a little bit about my company, if we both decide it makes sense, I'd like to move on and also share with you a couple of recommendations. Now, go ahead and say, would, would, you, would it be all right if I share with you a few recommendations that I have that personally I know are going to work for your business? Ask permission, and now what you're doing is you're moving on to that, moving on. But before I do that, I want to ask you, have you ever thought about why people can't buy from you? Thought about that? Well, number one, they can't buy if, you, if uh, they don't know what you offer. You have to be able to know your products and services to know with, to change on a dime when you're in a sales conversation, to change that recommendation to be able to know, all right, I'm going to remove this and put this in instead. All right? Also, they can't buy if you don't ask them. And they can't. You can't ask them if you don't know your products and services or you've not asked the right questions or you don't ask in the right way. Maybe the way you phrase your question, maybe there's an attitude in the question, the way you ask it all makes a difference. Every sales conversation has an opportunity. All right, now let's go on and let's talk about how do we recommend. Now, this may surprise you, but I'm telling you it works. Okay, here we go. First of all, never, ever, ever have only one recommendation prepared. Always have at least two recommendations. Do you have any idea why? Anybody? Right, give a choice. You want the customer to become active, interactive with you during the, during the recommendation process. So, and I'll talk a minute, uh, a little bit about that. You want to share no less than two recommendations. And I always follow Aristotle's algorithm. You tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them and then you tell them what you told them. And you give proof value. So I'm going, to tell, I'm going to share a couple of recommendations with you that I feel, based on what you've told me, makes the most sense. After we've done that, then we're going to go back over it and we're going to have you look at it to tell me how this works for you. Okay? All right, give the rate before you give the recommendation. Now, this is going to rock some of your worlds out there. You've got this big elephant in the room. It's the price. The customer likes you. You've got a good connection. Everything's going along. Oh, but my gosh, they're, you want them to hear you? They're not hearing you. If they're waiting, okay, get to the point. What's the price? I like all this stuff, but what? No, so get it out. Just say, all right, Wanda, I'm going to quote this to you. This is $5,000 a month. Now, let me tell you, okay, breathe. It's okay. It's all right. Let me share with you what it is, why. This is not a contract, but this is what you could have. And then you go right into it and you share it. And I want you to think of it as a big old block of ice. And as you prove value, you are chipping away at that block. So by the time you get done, you've got this beautiful sculpture that the customer can actually see themselves wanting to purchase. You see the difference? When you give the price first, you're professional, you stand behind your product, and by golly, you make sense of it to them. And people want to buy from professionals. And that's what you are. Defer objections. They go, oh, I'm not going to do that. Oh, my God, that costs too much. It's okay. Hold your horses. We're going to get there. I'm not, we're, we're talking about what could be, not what is. So just hang in there with me. You defer it and then you keep moving. Then at the end, you check in with the customer and you say, okay, now you've heard. And I always start, I do that at the end of my first, obje my first recommendation. Tell me what you like. Forget that you're, t I can't afford, okay, it's okay. Just put price over here. Tell me what you like. What would you change? You get them involved in what you're doing, okay? So that pretty soon, what happens is that recommendation becomes theirs. 
and that's the key. You want to have them feel comfortable that they're designing it for themselves, that works best for them. Okay, now, this is where you answer concerns, and it's the only place you answer concerns. If objections are on the table, if they're still there, then you need to ask yourself, did you ask the right questions in the first place? Did you prove value back in educating and during your recommendation? And did you, pre did you position the price correctly? Were they left with the price and they, they didn't hear anything you said? Okay, let's put it this way, folks. It is the salesperson's responsibility to knock down objections before they even are voiced. And if you have objections, the only thing that should be left is price. And that's, to me, that's the easiest one to work with. And I get into that in my workshops. But now let's talk about this. When you answer objections, the time to answer is at the at, at step six. And objection, folks, is a signal. It's a signal. It's also a buying sign. It's a buying sign if there is, if you're on common ground and it's an indication if you are not. So pay attention. It's an indication that value may not have been proven. Or it's actually a smoke screen. Like, for example, you know what? This sounds really good. Um, let me, I'll put it on next year's budget. That's a smoke screen for what, and what, what you need to dig deeper and find out. It's probably, again, the price. Use the customer's responses to answer their own objections. Now, you told me earlier, Janet, that you really needed a CRM that would do this, 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 exactly what you said before. You know, you'd repeat what their words are. Tell me what's, what's different. What is different from what you told me 10 minutes ago to where we are now? Well, I just can't afford it. Ah, there it is. It's the price. Now you've got it on the table and now you deal with it. Make sense? All right. Once you've gotten through that, now you're ready to gain agreement and finalize. How do you do that? Provide assurance. Everything we've talked about today, Lisa, is exactly, it fits exactly what you've told me you wanted to do. You've seen testimonials of other customers that I've shown you uh, that this is, they have the same situation, okay? Keep the conversation direct easy and relaxed, okay? Compliment their suggestions. Ralph, I, I, you know what? That's a good idea. I hadn't really thought of that, but I can absolutely see how that fits in. That makes total sense to me. All right, I think let, let's figure out how we can put that in here and make it work. Um, ask the customer to envision how this change would positively affect their business. Gerardo, tell me. You've made the decision to do this. What, what do you see changing in your business, let's say six months from now, once we implement this? Tell me. Ask one last direct question that confirms their commitment, such as, so, is there anything else you want to discuss? Do I have your permission to move ahead and finalize? And then what you want to do is a thorough contract review. Oh my gosh, people, I got to tell you, set the expectations. Go do be detailed. Make sure that they understand exactly what is expected of them, what is what they can expect of you, uh, what the time frames are of deliverables. Make sure they understand everything. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a world of hurt when the customer says, well, I thought you were going to deliver this five, five days ago. Why is it not here? Okay. All right. And this is follow through. This is number eight. How do you keep the promises that you make to your customers? Well, first of all, I try my best to count every day. I count my blessings. I'm so grateful to have customers to work with. That's number one. Take detailed notes when you're with the customer during the conversation. Make sure that you focus because I guarantee you, you'll get out of there, you go into the next customer, and you'll get back at your office. And two days later, which you may end up doing, looking and going, what the heck did he say? And then you find yourself embarrassingly have to call back. That's not good. 
time block your week. And when you time block your week, that means you're going to spend specific time to be able to do things such as log your notes into your CRM, uh, your, do your phone calendar, your day timer. Just make sure that you have set aside time to do all of this. And treat the processing of each account as if you were the, you, as if a rep, uh, you would want a rep to do for you. Hold yourself and your support team 100% accountable. Don't just turn your paperwork in and it's gone. That's your customer. It's not their livelihood on the line. It's yours. You're the one that, that they're going to call, not the customer service person behind you. So make sure you do the job the right way the first time. And set a timetable for completion and stick to it. If you tell the customer something, be ahead of it. If something goes wrong, get an email out and say, or, or pick up the phone and say, this is what's just happened. I want to be sure that, that um, you understand and why, why it's happened, okay? and promise only what you can deliver. Make sense? Only promise what you can deliver. And what were the last one is, and notice how we've kind of come full circle, show gratitude. You show gratitude in the beginning, you show gratitude in the end. And how do you express gratitude? Well, first of all, gratitude, it's the right thing to do. And it'll create loyal customers for you. But how do you do it? How do you do it in a way that nobody else does or doesn't even think about it? Well, first of all, you do it with a handwritten note. You can get your own stationery and just write, or a card, and just write a handwritten note. It's unexpected. People expect emails to come through. Don't get lost with everybody else. Also, do a short video. Take your phone and just as, as you've left, maybe the next morning, just say, Hey, Elsa, I want to thank you so much for your, the time that you took with me today or yesterday. I just wanted to, to one more time say thank you, and I will, I will give you the best service I possibly can. Okay? Short video. Feature your customers on your website. How cool is that? Share your customers' great news, great reviews. Invite your customers to post on your blog. Include your customers in your company events. And create thank you note videos uh, when your customer completes a form on your website. How about that? Instead of a thank you, do it with a video. All right. Well, as far as we're concerned here, that's the steps of the sale. That is what I feel and what I know works. And that uh, you can find in my book, Don't Sell, Let Them Buy. Um, but as a thank you, I also, I also want to let you know, I go into a lot of detail in my book, but as a thank you for being with me today, I, I want you to have my um, download. It's 19 pages, and wow, is it good. It's how to overcome objections and handle smoke screens and brush offs. If you don't have it, please, please get it. It's my thank you to you. And I would also like, like to know from you what what other sales conversation topics are you interested in that i could create a webinar or perhaps possibly a podcast um the most important thing is that you understand that your sales conversation is the heart of who you are when you're in front of a customer when you give of yourself the cut that reads and you're truly trying to connect with the customer. But it makes sense when you know where you're going. If the customer throws you off, but you have an organic structure and you know where you're going, then you can easily get right back on track. All right. I just want to thank you so much for the time that you that uh, you've spent with me today. I hope I've shared things with you. I would love to hear your feedback to know what other suggestions you have, what you liked, what you didn't like, and uh, I just want to be of service to you. So I'm not selling anything. I'm just, I'm giving. I want you to have what I didn't have in the first years of being a salesperson. I don't want anybody to go through that. And to be honest with you, why that company kept me on for as long as they did, but I was there for 22 years. Um, I'm very grateful. 
So with that, I want to sign off and I want to say thank you and I hope to hear from you. My phone number is on my website. I'm an open book. Feel free to call me and ask any question you, you desire. Thank you so much and make it a great day. Thank you.